Welcome to an exceptional edition of Rebellion's Educational Series, where we're going to explore the Seven Years' War, better known as the French Indian War, with New York Times bestselling author, really one of the most well known and well read history authors in America today, Harlow Unger. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure. Now, Harlow, you've got an amazing past, having been taught at Yale and having written 30 books, which are just stupendous, from Lafayette to Monroe to, you know, I, I've got to say, what I, I really get excited about, though, is your work on the Seven Years' War, which is what we're going to explore today. And I, I guess we should start with George Washington, who was really someone who was a major player in this war. In fact, started the war by, you know, having hostilities when he shouldn't have. Is there one story about George Washington that you feel epitomizes his work in this war? Well, yes and no. Uh, unfortunately, he was he started out as less than a hero. He was a 22-year-old major in the Virginia militia with no military experience of any sort, except marched around you know, on the campus of William & Mary College in Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, what had happened was uh, the British settlers had outgrown the original 13 colonies and began to move into and claim lands in the wilderness west of those 13 colonies out into western Pennsylvania and into the Ohio Territory. Well, the French had already claimed those lands and they started setting up forts along the Ohio River, and they built a big fort on what is present-day Pittsburgh, it was called Fort Duquesne. They uh, then tried to prevent the settlers, uh, and they tried to throw the settlers off the land. Well, the governor of Virginia, which was the largest, most powerful colony at the time, uh, decided uh, it was time to put a stop to French intrusions, and sent a Washington, who was quote, commander, unquote, as a major of the militia with 200 men out to Pennsylvania and Fort Duquesne to warn the French to stop interfering with British settlers. Uh, he got within uh, 25, 30, 40 miles of Fort Duquesne, came upon a little uh, clutch of French and Indians camped out, about 50 of them and ordered his men to slaughter them. Uh, not a wise thing to do. Uh, he then set up camp nearby in what was a saucer of land. And that was the thing. It was Fort Necessity, something we all learned as kids. We called it Fort Necessity. We were five or six years old, yes. And he was, he was obeying the theory, military theory at the, of, at the time of uh, building a camp in a saucer of land rather than on a hilltop in a saucer so that theoretically you would see the enemy coming over the lips of the saucer and you could pick them off one by one. Well, so saucer makes for a good you know, ski resort, but it does not seem to make for a very good uh, strategic place yeah, against an enemy combatant. But at the time it was thought to be the, the wise strategy and that's what he did at Fort Mitchell. Unfortunately, the rains came and inundated the saucer, turned it into a swamp. Uh, they, the, the Washington troops could hardly walk in, 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 the, in the mire, and the powder got soaked. Just then, who appeared on the lips of the saucer? <laughs> but a troop of Indians and French troops, and they slaughtered Washington's men. Uh, out of the two, the, the, the fewer than 200, 30 were left dead, 70 injured, and Washington, who had written the bragging letters home of how wonderful a brave he had been in slaughtering the Indians and French in that first encounter, now had to take his survivors home. Uh, and, and it's fair to say Washington started the world's first truly world war, multi-continent world war between multi-continent players. Indeed, when he fired those shots uh, and uh, massacred the Indians, that, those were the first shots 
transpired in what we now call the Seven Years' War, even though it was two years before the actual war um, became a world conflict. And in addition, that Seven Years' War was really an outgrowth of a previous war in the previous decade, from 1740 to 1748. It was called the War of the Austrian Succession. And what it was about and what the Seven Years' War was really about in Central Europe, there was a duchy called Silesia. It was the richest uh, area uh, in terms of re natural resources in Europe. It was the heart of the iron mining, coal mining, and metal mining uh, of the European industry. Uh, Prussia to the north and Austria to the south had been squabbling over it for generations. Mm -hmm. uh, to, the, to the east was lay Poland, to the west lay uh, the, the rest of what is now Germany. So it was right smack in the center of Europe. Uh, they had fought uh, in that first war from 1740 to 48 with uh, Prussia uh, uh, and taking Britain as an ally, uh, defeating Austria who had allied itself with France. Well, uh, as the French and Indian War, the war be uh, okay, but between the British and the French in North America, uh, expanded into the Atlantic, British and the French were so occupied that Austria and Prussia thought, well, we can go back to war again because <laughs> those two big powers won't interfere. So that, that, that got the Seven Years' War started again on continental Europe. Meanwhile, in America, uh, the uh, British had sent over an army. Well, first they sent over uh, 2,000 troops under General Braddock, and they marched to, they were going to throw the French out of Fort Duquesne in western Pennsylvania. And they marched away. They, went to yes, the they were slaughtered by the Indians in the trees, one of the but first... They, uh, they, they went to war the way they did it. Not technically an ambush, but described as an ambush. Well, it, it really was an ambush. The British thought they could fight the way they, the wars were waged in Europe, in line. All of the troops stood in a single line and marched together. Well, Indians didn't fight wars that way. Indians fought wars, crouched behind trees, jumping from one tree to the next, firing, jumping, firing, and they slaughtered the British. Again, Washington was humiliated. Uh, now, then, in revenge, didn't the British come back in truly American style by having this gigantic highway? Well, a year later, they came back and they decided they couldn't, they couldn't teach their troops how to fight Indian style, so they decided to turn the, the battlefield into a European battlefield they just knocked down all the trees and built this road out to Fort Duquesne and marched down the road uh, and not giving the Indians and French uh, any trees to hide behind. And they leveled Fort Duquesne and now marched up into Canada. And a war lasting uh, another few years, uh, actually it didn't last seven years, that's why it's often called the French and Indian War as opposed mm -hmm. to the Seven Years' War uh, within... Uh, Did Washington get any accomplishments in the Seven Years' War, or was it more failures? No, uh, only failure and, to a certain extent, humiliation. Uh, so he did not participate in the French... He did not participate anymore in what became the French and Indian War. Uh, the, the, the battlefield moved up into Canada uh, it, it, it did. There, there was a battle around Niagara Falls, uh, but that was the only real, uh, and, and a battle along Lake, Lake Champlain, uh, at the foot of Lake Champlain. Or Ticonderoga? Ticonderoga. Those, those are the only battles in what later became the United States. Most, the, the, the harshest warfare was in Canada, uh, first at Quebec, well, first at Louisbourg, uh, and I, uh, a huge French fortress uh, on the northern tip of Nova Scotia. Uh, then came uh, 
Battle of Jamaica, Battle of Quebec. And, uh, yes, the Battle of Quebec gets a lot of fame. Can you tell us more about that, please, Harlow? Well, it was an interesting battle in that the French were, uh, Quebec sits on top of a, of a plateau, an elevated plateau uh, called uh, the Plains of Abraham. And I don't know where it got that name, but that's what it was called. And the French were, were pretty well dug in on top of, of, of the Plains of Abraham. Uh, the British came by boat, landed at the foot of the cliffs, and during the night scaled the cliffs. An amazing feat. They scaled the cliffs, and at dawn, there they were on, uh, at, at the edge of the Plains of Abraham, firing at the, the sleepy French soldiers, and they won the Battle of Quebec. Uh, how did they scale the cliffs? Was it anything ingenuitive or was it just climbing? It was just climbing. It was just climbing, hand, hand over hand, uh, finding ledges. Uh, it was remarkable. It was one of the most remarkable feats in uh, North American warfare. Uh, and there were two battles up on, on the top, uh, both of which the British won. Uh, that, that took Quebec out of uh, French hands. Uh, they then had to fight the Battle of Montreal, uh, which sits on the island, and, uh, and, and finally expelled the French. Uh, in expelling the French, the British troops committed one of the first great atrocities. Speaking of naval battles, John Paul Jones is a you know, famous you know, fighting sailor. Not in that war. That, John Paul Jones is in the Revolutionary War. A total, total myth in the Seven Years' War. No, he had nothing to do with Seven Years' okay. War. He was just a boy. Uh, but in, in seizing Canada, the French, the British Army committed one of the worst atrocities in, in, in uh, American history at the time. Uh, they demanded that all the French settlers in Canada take an oath to the British Crown. Uh, the, French Canadians in New Brunswick, what are called Acadians, uh, refused. Mm. It, to them, it was a violation of their religious beliefs to swear an oath to a king, any king, uh, certainly the king of Britain. And the British forcibly evacuated them with only the clothes on their backs and sailed them. Uh, down some ships put in at various ports along the east coast. Uh, the largest group uh, was, was sailed down to the New Orleans area uh, where they established the French language presence that exists to this day. So that was a terrible outgrowth of the French Indian War. Uh, the war then left ended in North America. They continued on the Atlantic. Uh, it was fighting at sea in the Caribbean to control the Caribbean. It spread into the across the Atlantic, into the Mediterranean, and even into the Indian Ocean. Uh, it, it, oh, the Indian Ocean went as far as wow. It, it, it went as far as India and the Philippines. It, 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 there was a major battle in the Philippines, yes. Uh, over Manila, there was the Battle of Manila. Uh, the French lost. Uh, that by then Spain had entered the conflict, and uh, Spain, uh, at the end of the French, at the end of the Seven Years' War, in the settlement, uh, Spain gained control of several of the French Caribbean islands, including Cuba. Uh, they gained control of the Philippines uh, in the Pacific. And the French lost all of their colony, all of their. Uh, Possessions in India, except for the port uh, area of Pondicherry, and they lost most of their possessions in Africa, except in parts of Senegal. They lost all of their North American, continental North American possessions. They lost all Canada and all of the lands of, in what later became the United States. Well, from a net gain, net loss perspective, one could say the Seven Years' War was the most devastating for the country of France 
besides uh, World War II when they you know, fell completely to Hitler? France was the big loser in the Seven Years' War. So oh. Every nation, every nation, there were, uh, well, there were 10 nation, actual nations, and you could say even 12 because you had the provincial forces of what later became Canada and the provincial forces of what later became the United States involved. Mm -hmm. The only nation that didn't get involved was Turkey, but you had Russia, Austria, Poland, Sweden, Russia, Spain, Hanover was a country then, Saxony, uh, and of course France and Britain. Uh, you had Spain and Portugal, and as I said, the provincial forces of North, both North America, future North American countries. So all were involved, and the losses were just astounding. Just tried to do that. Uh, these losses allow the Revolutionary War to occur? Would you say were they connected significantly? Uh, well, yes and no. The losses in manpower. Uh, in one battle, the Russians lost 14,000 men, the Austrians in 13,000. In another, the, in the Prussians lost only 548 men, but the French lost 10,000 and the Russians 21,000. Uh, and on and on, 22,000 Austrians in one battle, 23,000 Russians in another, 19,000 Russians in another. After so it grew years, with the other world wars and that it drained resources and accomplished nothing, except of course expelling a psychotic dictator. But aside from that, you know, world wars have generally just taken away talents and- Well, but after, after, after seven years, one and a half million men died in battle. And for what? After seven years, all European borders were reinstated as they had been before the war had started. So an exercise in futility. So a, a million and a half men died for nothing. The French were the big losers. They were stripped of their worldwide empire. They lost all Canada, but uh, the British were the big winners, gaining all the continental North America. But both France and Britain were bankrupt, as were all of the other nations. They didn't have a cent left. And to raise funds, the British tried raising taxes, uh, property taxes in Britain, and a, a farmer's rebellion ensued. Farmers rioted. And to put it down, they, re they repealed the taxes and decided to put a tax on Americans. Now, one of your great books is on the Boston Tea Party. Exactly. Uh, the, uh, of course, they couldn't raise taxes in Britain. They tried to raise taxes in America, and that violated the original agreement between the British government and the British settlers in America. That agreement was that the settlers would come to America and, and clear the land, clear the forest, and grow produce, grow products, sell them, exclusively to, Brit to Britain mm -hmm. and keep all the profits from the sale. Now the British government decided to tax those profits and the Americans will have none of it. They said that's confiscation, it violates the, the, the uh, agreement between uh, Britain and her subjects in America. And those are the, those are the seeds uh, of, of the Revolutionary War and the, or the War of Independence. Uh, very uh, fantastic. Yeah, the Seven Years' War was not just dreadful in the sense that uh, the loss of men, the loss of, of wealth. You have to remember that kings, you know, Thomas Paine, I wrote a book on Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine said that, that kings are nothing but thugs. William the Conqueror was the first king. He was a thug. We thought, oh, 1066 when he sailed across. Yeah, he sailed across. <laughs> he landed on the beaches. A gang of thugs landed on the beaches and beat up the poor uh, semi literate fishermen mm -hmm. and said, I'm, I'm, I'm boss here. And he called himself a king. Then he beat up the, the, the uh, religious leaders and said, You tell them that God sent me. And that was the birth of the divine right of kings. No. The ignorant people accepted it for centuries. And then these thugs start going to war with each other the way the, the drug gangs go to war with each other today. 
uh, with the war over resources and wealth, because each one wanted more wealth than the other thing. But they were nothing but thugs. They called themselves kings, but they were thugs. And a million and a half innocent people died in this stupid war. Uh, from a positive perspective, our nation's founding father did gain quite a bit of experience, at least. Yes, uh, and uh, what he really learned, uh, the greatest thing he learned, uh, 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 and this is in his diary, the greatest thing he learned was how little he knew. And he began to study. He began to accumulate books, study military strategy, study history. He became a great historian before, before the Revolutionary War began, when he was uh, named by Conrad Congress as commander in chief of the Army. He had accumulated more than a thousand books that he had read. And I can vouch that he read, read them. He was one of the nation's wealthiest men, right? Well, he became one of the wealthiest men. Uh, he inherited uh, the plantation. At what it sounds, it was called, what it was called Mount Vernon, uh, just south of Washington, in Virginia. He heard of that from his older brother. Uh, there were no other heirs. And he, over the years, uh, became, Washington became one of the great agricultural scientists. He uh, studied grafting. He, he studied all of this. And he wrote learned articles for uh, learned journals of uh, uh, agriculture uh, that were published in Britain, but under a pseudonym or just anonymous, anonymous so he didn't want to publicity. Started the French years war as a you know an arrogant you know bragger. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. He's proud of his oh, uniform. Proud of his yeah, yeah. Like, like any youngster. Uh, no, no, my just out of the military academy, you know, a, a little swagger, beautiful sword, beautiful uniform. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. And unfortunately, it costs a lot of lives, but uh, it was inevitable. He had to learn uh, the hard way, oh. especially in a wilderness of war. No, I mean, the, the Braddock ambush, which is one of the most famous uh, historical battles of all time, was really just a total slaughter. I mean, you had, what, 2,000 men up against uh, 300 French and Indians, totally, you know, totally taken down. And then after they surrendered, they were, they were still outnumbering the French and Indians even when they were surrendering. So it was uh, really just pathetic. But it was Washington's work with the rear flank, right, that did save a number of lives, you'd say? Indeed. Uh, he said, well, I did because he knew the way. Okay. And uh, the pursuers did not. Moreover, the pursuers uh, did not want to get too far from their base of operations. No. They did not want to follow uh, the Washington forces into Virginia. It was just too far away from their base. Yeah, I don't know if there's any historical connection between when Magua betrays uh, the uh, British and last of the Mohicans, but you know the battle definitely is very reminiscent of uh, one another, where you have British uh, being absolutely slaughtered. They're doing their normal uh, uh, I don't. There's no. I think I couldn't find any historical connection. But just, just inspiration. Uh, last Mohican fiction. Uh, no, no, total, no. That, yeah, of course, it's a fiction. A fiction book that came out uh, in the 1930s. Uh, you know, just. Uh, a, a, a love story, really, that takes place during the French Indian War. But nevertheless, you know, for people who don't know General Braddock, he was a, a British general who was sent over to quell and to take land, and he ended up, you know, getting buried by his troops in this terrible ambush. Uh, and there's now dozens of areas around Pennsylvania named after Braddock, including a mountain. So I was first to learn. But uh, anyway, th this has been uh, fantastic, uh, Harlow. Um, I guess, you know, I, my, my last question for you would be, do you have any parting thoughts for our viewers? Is there anything you'd like to say in conclusion here? Well, there are lessons to be learned that most people will not or refuse to learn, and that is the futility of war. Uh, 
Seven Years War is a perfect, absolute perfect example. Well, you make a great point, Harlow. I wonder if we do a plot, you know, just a, some, a data science plot over the last few hundred years of the number of wars, number of casualties of wars versus actual accomplishments. You know, how do, how do first of all, how do we define accomplishments? I guess, you know, ex expunging, uh, the Holocaust expunging, um, you know, mass slaughter can be a positive, but at the same time, you have so many wars where there was nothing. I mean, Vietnam is a war we discussed in the show recently, and that's a war where really, uh, you know, I, I can't say anything was accomplished. Uh, it was complete futility. So we've had so many wars with just complete futility, no gain. It, it seems the majority of wars are just awful. And so uh, I, I guess that, that would be your feeling of the seven years where that it was really beyond being the first world war, it was just one of the most futile acts of men. And, and uh, you bring up a good point. In the modern era, uh, what today uh, did the Korean War accomplish? What today has our... Uh, uh, the what war accomplished? The Korean War. Oh, the Korean War. That was, uh, that was one of the, another horrible example of futility where you had, you know, machoism and, you know, the Chinese were so outnumbering our troops so that when we crossed that parallel, we were, you know, I mean, that was, you know, ego is what uh, took Icarus down and ego is what's taken down many of the military generals. And uh, what, in the long run, what today, how, in what way can we measure any uh, advantage today of our long involvement in Afghanistan Iraq, uh, now in Syria, in Africa, we, we have more than a half million men in 50 countries across the earth. What are they doing? <laughs> how, how are you and I better off because of their presence? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if you can answer well, that. They're always bad actors. So I guess my point would be we don't have to engage in war, let's keep ourselves ready and equipped, and let's have a high barometer for conflict. What, that's, that's, I guess, what should be the, the, the new question, is what is the barometer for conflict? And maybe it's something that we need to take much more seriously in the future. So I personally love having, you know, Churchill said, you know, walk softly and carry a big stick. The United States' big stick is our military. So I personally love having the strongest military possible. And I would love to grow military spending at a percentage of GDP because I'm also an economist and I see that as a positive. But how we spend that military is a completely, in my opinion, mutually exclusive point to military spending. Mutually, military spending and military, you know, uh, actual deployment, those are separate issues. And I think when it comes to military deployment, you and I are on the same page. Not just spend how we spend it, it's how we deploy the military. The deploy, because deployment is everything, yes. Yeah, yeah we have, should, I mean, do we really need uh, troops in the Central African Republic? Uh, are, are you and I better off because of, we have troops in the Central African Republic? I'm sure our troops there are not better off. I'm sure they, they don't love that assignment. Or the Washington the Post called you one of the nation's greatest historical presidential biographers, not sp something along those lines. I remember reading it, I was like, oh my God, wow, what a recommendation. Can we jump to Richard Nixon and the Christmas Day bombings? Because that's something we also discussed recently on this show. Do you have a specific point on that? Do you think that was just a manifestation of his uh, psychosis? Uh, the Christmas Day bombings to me seem to be one of the craziest acts in American military history. I really don't, uh, I'm not uh, qualified to, to discuss the Nixon administration. I didn't cover it as a Okay, yeah, I know that's jumping far too, I know that's jumping quite a bit from uh, the Revolution of War, I apologize, but this was, a, this was an amazing show, Harlow, really amazing show. And before we end, I wanna go through, everyone needs to go out and read first Lafayette, which was an amazing book that I read about 20 years ago. Absolutely loved it. Lafayette was a good friend of Hamilton and they were sons of Washington. And if you want to understand America, the founding and George Washington, Lafayette is, a, is an essential book. So I, I highly recommend that. And if you want to read about a wise president, you read my book on Monroe, The Last Founding.
Your Mon- no, but your Monroe book is can, is a highly, highly acclaimed New York Times bestseller. And for anyone who wants to understand presidential his- history, it, it's a must. And so, you know, Harlow, thank you so much. And oh no, my pleasure is all mine. You're fantastic. Uh, be well. Be safe.